that which was lost. It's good to see the number out this evening that is here. This morning we had 136, which is a good number. We had a, quite a few visitors this morning. I'm looking, have a few visitors in our midst this evening. So that's a good thing, even considering we have a huge number on the road going to polishing the pulpit for the week, we still had good numbers. This morning we started out, we looked at a lesson of Christ as the message of the church. This evening, I want to continue on that theme. This morning, we looked at Christ's message of the church. This evening, we need to realize what we need to do with that message. We found out what the message is to be, but what are we supposed to do with it? Who are we supposed to take it to? So our mission is what we're going to look at. Our mission is to be what Jesus said that he came to do. Here in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he says he came to seek and save that which was lost. This is our greatest purpose in life, is to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, also in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Not to use elaborate words, not to use big elaborate speech. Not supposed to be making a name for ourselves like some in this world would want to do and make all kinds of money doing it. It doesn't matter if we don't make one cent out of speaking for congregation. It's knowing that we're fulfilling the will of the Father and helping to seek and save that which is lost. We need to remember that Christ came to serve and he's, he's our example. Galatians, before we get to our slides, here's some verses to go with our lesson. It's Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Or Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then John says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. We need to be patterning our lives after the same example Christ gave. Yes, he was the son of God. Yes, he was flawless. Can we be flawless like he was? No. But can we pattern our lives after that? Yes, we can. We can't perform the miracles he performed. But we can convey to people the good news that there's something far greater that awaits when we leave this life. Something far greater. Something that we need to be. Even the name that we wear when we are brought into the kingdom of God, into the church, Christian, signifying we belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to him, we serve him. We are no longer a slave to sin, but we are his servant. And we ought to have this desire to live the way he lived while he was on this earth. So first thing we need to do is in our mission is to realize that there are people who are lost in this life. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, we need to realize it's just not a few thousand people or a few million people. There are billions of souls outside these walls racing toward eternity in a lost state. Billions. Go home, take a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and write one billion down there and look how many zeros there is. Then take a look at that number compared to the population of the United States. We don't even come close to that. Think about this. If we took the population of the United States and multiplied it by five, there's still more people than that speeding every day toward eternity in a lost state. We've been commissioned to take the good news of Jesus Christ to these people. We live in a day and a time when we have been blessed beyond measure with measures that brethren through the years were not blessed with, that they had to travel by horseback, they had to walk or use other conveyances. 
Then we had the invention of automobiles and airplanes that we can go around and we can begin to travel further distances to get to people. Now we have technology. We have the internet, we have television, we have radio. We have smart devices. We have the ability to live stream this worship service that we're in right now so that every soul on this planet, if they wanted to be a part of this, have the opportunity to do so. We've been blessed beyond measure. We need to realize and identify that there are lost people out there. How do we know that there are lost people out there? Matthew records Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 7, and verses 13 and 14, Jesus there says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are those which go into that one. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leads to eternal life. And few will be the find in. The majority of mankind is speeding down I-81, not knowing, like I said a couple weeks ago, there's doom and destruction at the end of that line. But if we're willing to go over here and take side road, a little side, let's think about this. One of these little side roads went up across the Sleepy Creek. Well, one lane road that's as crooked as a snake going across there that you have to run maybe five mile an hour to get across and has potholes and slips along the way. We're not as likely to be in an accident over there and be killed, are we? No. It's a little trickier. We have to read that we may have to we may have to pay attention to the signs that are up warning us of one lane road ahead. There are things there. There are few people on that road. But you're sure to make your destination. But we got here on the nice big six lane highway or whatever in four, six, eight lane highways, people are moving faster and faster every day. And every day we turn on the news, people are being losing their lives. There's doom and destruction. We need to be thinking about this. We need to realize that there are so many people racing toward eternity and we need to identify who they are and realize that the majority of people we come in contact with are in that. Now, some people are ignored and overlooked. How do we, uh, how, Jonathan, how are we ignoring, how are we overlooking people in the world? Matthew, again, chapter 12, verse 30, records, he that is not with me is against me. This is Jesus speaking. And he who gathers not with me scatters abroad. There are good moral people in this life who are going to live a good moral life. They're going to be married. They're going to stay with that spouse. They're going to raise their children to do the right things. They're going to have a good, honorable job. They're going to be upstanding citizens in this, world, in this life. But there's something lacking. That's Jesus Christ in their life. Christ is lacking in their life. And because they're a good, moral, upstanding citizen in this life, there are times we tend to forget they need to be ministered to sometimes more than a lot of other people who would be may consider hoodlums. We're more apt to go out to the person who is acting out and acting strange, who is showing odd behaviors and things like that. We're more, at times we're more apt to go to that person than we are to the person who is a moral person or someone who is part of a denomination. Well, they go to church on Sundays and they do these things. Who do they serve? Are they worshiping God the way they ought to? Are they serving God the way they ought to serve him? Are we talking about Jesus Christ with them? Or are we just skipping over the topic because it's not one of those topics we want to talk about? It's not one of those topics we want to talk about. Because what we need to remember is what Matthew says in chapter 7 of his book. Again, Jesus speaking here, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? That time I will profess to them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity or lawlessness. Many good people in this life who do many good things, yet they never make their heart right with God. Many people who are close to me in this life are just like that. Will do anything for anyone. They, they live a life, some, some of them live a life more faithful than some of the, those individuals who we would consider brethren. But the thing that's missing in their life is obedience to the Lord and Master. We need to re- remember as we're going through here and we're looking at these people and realizing who the lost are, whether it's family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, whoever it is that we come in contact with, that being lost means eternal separation from God. And this is not a comprehensive list that I have here. These passages are just starting points of where to go. But I want us to think about this eternal, and I'm not, I promise we're not going to dwell on, 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 the, on, on, the, on the destruction side of things. But I want to make sure to emphasize this, that we have to remember that Matthew, again, records in chapter 25, Jesus saying in verses 41 and 46, he says, Then they shall say to them, on the, that he shall say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And in verse 46, he says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Like I said this morning, it ought to bring tears to our eyes to think that there are going to be billions of souls stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ in the day of judgment when it's too late. Not standing there with him being their judge and their defense attorney, but standing there with him being their judge and prosecutor finding them guilty and saying, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. I never knew you. How terrifying that is. It ought to motivate each and every one of us to make more contact with those who we around us and who we claim to care about, whom we claim to love. You say you love someone, but you don't take Jesus Christ to them. You need to re-examine your love for them. Whether it's your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, re-examine that, what you just said. Because if you're not going to take Jesus Christ to them, you really don't love them. That sounds harsh. Yes, it does, doesn't it? That's just the fact of the matter. You don't love them the way that God wants you to love them. You love them the way you want to love them. You made yourself again the king of your life and you need to come back and rearrange that and put Christ back as king of your life. Like we talked about this morning. We really need to, be, we need to do self-examination to make sure that we are conveying this to those who are identifying these people. Secondly, we need to be seeking them out. We need to remember that the lost are not going to come into us. Not unless they're already studying and they're seeking the truth. Now, that does happen occasionally, that there are going to be individuals who open their Bible up and they say, hey, wait a minute. There's something that is wrong with what I have been taught all my life. There's something not, that doesn't make sense. I'm going to seek out truth, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not as often as you think it is. It requires us living a faithful Christian life and seizing the opportunities that are presented to us to speak Jesus Christ to these people. Now, does that mean you get up in their face and you tell them, that you sit down with them and you, and you and tell them, we have to, you have to read this, you have to believe? No. The life you live, a lot of times, is the only Bible a lot of people are ever going to read. There are going to be times when you may have a, you, you may be able to have someone in the car with you and you're able to talk to them, a coworker. You talk to them. You plant that seed and it begins to grow.
You know, I want to stop right here for just a moment and say this. If we actually take time and stop and come back to being God's family and visit with each other the way we need to be and getting to know each other the way we ought to, we're going to learn a lot about each other. We're going to learn a lot. Since I've moved here, I've actually had the opportunity to visit with quite a few individuals and learned a lot about a lot of the members here in Central. And I've recently learned that actually was one of our members in this congregation was how they were converted. It was a member of the church that they were riding with back and forth to work on a weekly basis. Planted that seed. That individual is a very faithful member of this congregation. We can talk all day and we can talk all night about taking the good news of Jesus Christ out to the world. We can talk about how to identify him. But until we stop and know who we are to each other, it's not going to work. We have to know each other internally. We have to know, we have to get to know each other. We have to get to know how we as a family correlate to one another and how we interact with one another. That's where, the, that's, where we, that's where we learn the tools to be able to go out here and to seek out those who are lost. And that's where we learn the skills of being able to better evangelize to the individuals like we're talking about right now, of taking the gospel to them. Jesus, again, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. The Great Commission, the goat out into all the world. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul records there, these things that you have heard among, of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What did Jesus say in Matthew's account of the Great Commission? Go out and make disciples of the nations. That's teaching the individuals to follow Jesus Christ. But it's also while we're doing that and we're teaching the individuals. Now, we're not going to get every person inside of a physical nation to obey the gospel. But when, the, when it starts having an impact, what's going to happen? the attitude and the demeanor of that culture and that society is going to begin to turn. You're not going to see the heathenistic behaviors that we're currently seeing in our own nation existing anymore. You're going to see people begin to act in a godly manner. They're going to begin doing what they did 100, 100, 100 to 200 years ago when this type, the type of behavior that's being currently accepted in our country even go back 75 or 80 years in our history, was rejected and rebuked and people were shunned for acting the way they do today. Yet today it's accepted. And somehow we as the Lord's church have become numb to that. Right along with the rest of the world. We need to get back to when it hits like that, that it's a shock and awe on us. And we say, hey, wait a minute. What can I do to help cure this problem? The cure is to teach Jesus as a message of the church and to go out and seek them out and teach them on a one-on-one -on -one basis to bring them back to their God where they belong. And thirdly, if I can get this to switch, is to do what Jesus said. We're to seek and to save. We need to identify the lost. When we identify who's lost, we need to go ahead and start seeking them out, figuring out how can I help to teach them. Seek them out. And then we are to do our best to teach them the good news of Jesus Christ that they can be saved. Not by my authority, not by your authority. Going back to what Jesus said, all authority is given me in heaven and on earth. It's, the authority, it's by the authority of the Lord God of heaven. Jehovah God, the one who's the author, the creator, the giver, the sustainer, and ultimately the taker of life, both physical and spiritual. 
By his authority, everything happens. And it's under his authority that mankind is saved in a spiritual sense, that the soul man is saved. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. Think about this. We are not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to take that. It's good news. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's good news. Why would you want to hold good news back from anyone? I remember when Ashley and I found out that we were expecting Annabelle. That was good news. And it was everything I could do to hold, the, you know, not say anything to anyone, including family, for that first trimester to make sure everything went well. And then it was like we could jump up and down, yell and scream and, t- and t- tell to everyone we came in contact with. It's good news. But there's even better news. There's even better, there's even better news. Than that, than the, 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 the expected arrival of a, of a child into a family. And that is, there's salvation for every soul under heaven. Many people will say, well, if I went into a church building and lightning would strike it. No, it won't. Apostle Paul said he considered himself to be, himself to be the chiefest of sinners. Think about this. Paul, who was in his earlier days, Saul, consented to the stoning of Stephen. He persecuted Christians. He killed them. He imprisoned them. Disrupted their activities of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Yet his heart was impacted. Authored more books in the New Testament than anyone else more books. Luke actually authored the majority of the the, the word, more words than anyone in the New Testament between Luke and Acts. That's for a different study. But I just thought I'd throw that in there. Paul Paul wrote the most books. Luke wrote, volume-wise, the most words. Approximately 28% of what we read in the New Testament was written by, by Luke. But, coming back to this, Paul describes that the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection. We covered this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 this morning. How Christ wrote, it was, he died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And we must obey the gospel. We need to, we need to be reminded continually. It's not what, it's not, a, it's not the message I want it to be. It's not the message any anyone else wants to be. It's the message that is written for us to follow. Think about this. There's so many people in this life that will say, well, the only thing you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Or, well, the only thing you have to do is believe and and, and live a good life. Or just believe and confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, those are steps along the way in the scheme of redemption. But that's not all that we know. That's not what all is included. Yeah, we hear the word of God presented to us. And that's what we're supposed to be doing every day of our lives. Every opportunity we have is proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. Whether they're in the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ. We believe that Jesus, we believe in the word of God. We believe that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. We turn away from our old sinful paths. Yes, we confess Jesus Christ as the son of the true and living God. How many times we get down to that and people say, that's all you need to do. That's not what we're told in that when we read through the entire New Testament, put the pieces together. I said this morning, physical immersion in water is necessary. For the scheme of redemption is laid out in God's word to be fulfilled and to be complete. And it just doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. Because then we live a faithful life. 
Romans chapter 6, and verse 17. Paul again records there, he says, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. And then dropping back, going back in that same chapter, verses 3 and 4, he says, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. The form of the gospel that we preach and teach is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That form of the gospel that we tell people to obey is that same gospel message that we read in the Bible that was effective on the day of Pentecost and is still good today and will be good the same moment the Lord comes again and calls time to be no more. Our mission to identify those who are lost, seek them out, and teach them so they can be saved. But where does it all start? It starts with our lesson this morning. Realizing that Jesus Christ is the message of the church. That's where it all starts. It starts with each of us realizing that in our own hearts. It starts with each one of us preparing our minds to go not just in the future sometime. Beginning right now. Not in the morning. Right now. Result, be giving a resolve to live a faithful Christian life, to convey that good news to whoever we come in contact with that needs it, whether it's a fellow brother or sister in Christ or someone who's still outside the body of Christ, to do that which is right. So if there's anyone here this evening who's outside the body of Christ, it's a convenient time for you to make your wishes known to make yourself right. To be buried in the water grave of baptism. And for those of us gathered here, to rejoice with the angels in heaven as the Lord adds your name to the Lamb's book of life. And you begin walking faithfully with your Lord and Master. So when we get to the day of judgment... How grand it would be if every soul who's ever lived under heaven could hear those blessed words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. That would be a wonderful thing. Let's strive to take as many souls with us as possible. Whatever the need may be, make it known while together we stand and sing.